I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to St. Luke, the good news of Luke, chapter 13, beginning with the 10th verse of this chapter. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. Praise God. And Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent or bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I want to use for a subject tonight, a picture is worth a thousand words. You may be seated. All through the Bible, you'll find beginning from Genesis all the way to Malachi, God is constantly speaking to the prophets and speaking through the tabernacle and the Moses and the sacrifices, that he, he is a God of love. Don't ever get the idea that God is not a God of love in the Old Testament. God has always been a God of love. In fact, he loves, with, loves us with everlasting love. And so God is telling us that he loves us. He uh, gave us the law of God because he loves us. He told us to the prophets that he loved us. And all through the scriptures, in fact, you can see the sunrise and the sun is saying, God loves you. At night when the sun sets and the moon rises and begins to reflect and shine to the darkness, God is saying, I love you. Land and sea, the food that we eat, the beauty that we are surrounded by, the light that penetrates our lives and the blessings that come our way is all saying, I love you. God is saying, I love you. And so all through the scriptures, you'll find that God is saying that I love you. In fact, God could have spoke from heaven with a mighty thunder and shattered the atmosphere like glass and cried out, hey, I love you. Well, he could have done that. So he decided that rather than that, he would send us a picture. That he actually would come and bring to us a word picture that Jesus Christ would give us a picture of who God is and how majestic God is. And in this scripture that I read to you about this woman that was bent over and could not stand up straight, in the synagogue, Jesus Christ has given us a beautiful picture of God's love and God's purpose for our life. Did you know God has a purpose? A lot of people are trying to find out what their purpose is in life. Well, God has a purpose too. And we're gonna talk about God's purpose and the blessings of God and the goodness of God and I want to begin by simply saying that this woman was at the synagogue. Jesus Christ is teaching there, the Bible says, at a certain synagogue. And there he heals her. She's bent over. She cannot stand up straight. In fact, after he heals her, some of the people got full of indignation, was mad because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. That was the religious um, critical Pharisee crowd, Sadducee crowd, the priest crowd that was very bitter because Jesus Christ healed someone on the Sabbath. And they said, you have six days in which to work. Do your healing on those days. Don't do it on the Sabbath. Now, I may know that is that got to be the most ludicrous, crazy thing that anybody would ever say. And so Jesus just jacked their jaw by the Spirit of God. I mean, he just slapped them right in the kisser and told them that this is the way it is. He says, you hypocrites, you, you'll take your, which one of you don't take your, 
your oxen and your ass down and lo unloose it and lead it to the water and give it drink on the Sabbath. Should not this woman that has been bound by Satan all these years be loosed and given healing? And that, how many know that shut their pucker up real good? That, how many know God knows how to shut their puckers up? Right? And so uh, I want to point out some things tonight that, uh, and I want to inform you, I want to help you. I want, I want you to walk out of here and say, wow, Jesus is awesome. And, and I want you to learn something. I want you to be enriched with the Spirit of God. Uh, and I think when I, by the time uh, the Spirit of God is through with us that we will walk out of this building tonight and say, I have definitely received a vein of gold and silver and blessings from the Lord through the message tonight. I believe that with all my heart. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, trouble you with it. I'd let somebody else preach. But I'm here and you're stuck with me and there we go. We're gonna do it, amen. But uh, I wanna point out that Jesus Christ said that this woman was bound by Satan. Verse 16 of Luke 13 says, and ought not this woman, he's speaking to the Pharisees and the priests, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loose from this bondage on the Sabbath day. And that just really put an end to their, their indignation and their accusations against this woman in Jesus Christ. I want to begin by saying that this woman, bound physically, she was bent over, she couldn't stand up straight, but she made her way to the synagogue on a regular basis on the Sabbath. Her life was miserable. She was bent over. She had some problems in her life. How many would agree being bent over and can't stand up straight is a problem? It's a real problem because, because all you can do is look down at the ground and you can't, you can't see nothing. You're like this, you're trying, you can't, and you're looking down all the time. Probably had enormous pain in her back probably t tremendous pain in her legs and her feet because of her position physically, but yet she had make her way to, and she didn't have, I have no doubt in my mind, she didn't ride a camel, didn't ride a donkey, uh, she didn't ride a chariot. I have no doubt in my mind, she walked to the, to the, uh, to the synagogue every Sabbath day. Jesus Christ is there teaching the word of God and here she is, she's got problems and Jesus Christ after healing her and telling the, the, the scribes, Pharisees and so on, the critics that it was justified to heal her, this woman being a woman of uh, Abraham, it would be proper to heal her even on the Sabbath day. And Jesus Christ said, this woman in whom Satan has bound. Now let me say right now, it does not say that this woman was demon possessed. It does not say this woman was, that the devil was inside of her. It does not say that this woman being bound by Satan, it does not say she was a bad woman, did not say she was a, evil person, doesn't say she did anything evil. It just says that she was bound by the devil. And I think the church is full of people that are bound, maybe bound mentally, maybe bound physically, maybe bound spiritually, that they're not bad people. They come to church, they're having a hard time and Satan is messing with their life. And Satan was messing with this woman's life. It's a good reason to be in church when your life's got trouble. It's a good reason to come to the house of God time after time after time preparing for something miraculous to happen. I'd venture to say that those miraculous things will happen many times, not always, but many times as we gather in Jesus' name in the house of God. And this woman had gathered and she had been bound by Satan. Not possessed, she wasn't a bad person. 
She was a daughter of Abraham. She went to the synagogue. She went, I believe every week she went there. I believe she was a good woman. I think she probably was an older woman. I know, I, I don't believe that she was 18 years old. The Bible says that she was bent over for 18 years, crippled for 18 years. And I just can't hardly believe that, that she was an 18-year-old lady. I think she was probably an older lady. And yet she still found time to give God praise and give God glory even in her perpetual mess. But yet Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath she came honoring her God. And I don't think she came to get healed necessarily. I think she came because she had a deep love for Jehovah. I don't think necessarily she was showing up every week to get healed. I think she came because that was the thing to do. God's a good God. God's a wonderful God. God's a powerful God. And God is worthy to be praised. That's why she was there. And no matter her infirmity, no matter her hard position in life, she chose to look and be in the house of the Lord and give God glory. She had been in a bad shape, the scripture says, for 18 years. Verse 11 says, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent together, and uh, could not in no wise lift up herself. I'm going to go on to say that I don't believe not only could she not lift herself up, people couldn't lift her up either. I believe when they picked her up, they just picked her up still being over I think if they had forced her to stand up, they'd have broke something. Amen. And anytime you're in the house of God dealing with people's problems, if you force them, you're going to break something. You're going to break their confidence in God. You're going to break their, their, their trust in the Lord. They're going to be wounded and hurt and, and violated because they, they feel like they're half a Christian or a piece of God. You're not a half a Christian and you're not a piece of God. You're a child of Almighty God. If you've been born again and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're not halfway there. You're a child of God, amen. But for 18 years this woman went, 18 years she went uh, uh, day after week after week to the, to the synagogue, praising God, honoring God. She she wasn't half of a half of a Christian. She wasn't half a half of a daughter of Abraham. She wasn't. She wasn't a piece of a servant of God. She loved God, or she wouldn't be there. She she cherished God, and I believe that whatever she did, she did out of the gratitude of her heart. Yes, she had problems, and yes, she had trials, and yes, she suffered more than probably anyone in this room. But she knew that God was a good God and there was a heaven beyond the blue and that there was somewhere to go that was greater than this planet earth and Jesus Christ was going to come. She didn't know him as the name Jesus, but she knew the Messiah was on his way. Amen, come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding. And so everybody in this room, listen to me, you're gonna have some cold days. You're gonna have some painful moments. You're gonna have some storms. You're gonna have some trials. You're gonna have some moments when you're, you're, you're suffering. But I remember as a young man when we were on the farm and we heated with wood. Judy and I lived down in Galena for quite some time and, and when we heated with wood, old pot belly stove in the middle of the living room, we'd put wood in there. When it came time to go to bed, what we would do is we'd bank the fire. And if you know what bank to fire means, it meant you took, you took the hot coals, the burning hot coals, and you put them to the side of the stove, and then you take shovels of ashes, and you cover the hot coals with ashes, and you, you cover it and bank it. You bank it against the side of the stove, and there you go to bed at night, and the, the fire is smothered with those ashes. But when you get up in the morning, it's cold. When you get up in the morning, the floor is cold. You don't want to be barefoot walking across the linoleum. It's cold. And you get up 
and it's a cold day and the wind's whistling outside and the snow's blowing and it looks like it's gonna be a hard day but you walk up to that stove and because you banked the fire, because you put some, some, some blessings against the side of that stove, you pull back those ashes, you throw a little bit of wood inside, you open the damper, you open the uh, air vents, uh, you'd close them when you banked it and then you open them up and the wind, whoosh, and the wind begins to blow and, the, and the, those hot coals begin to ignite that wood and a fire begins to boil and begin to rage and begin to uh, 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 blaze in the stove and next thing you know it's warm as toast inside. Amen. And I want you to know there's gonna be some cold days in my life but I banked the fire in my heart. There's gonna be some times in our life that we're going through trials, but I've banked a fire in my heart. I've taken the blessings of God. I know there's gonna be bad days. I know there's gonna be dark days. I know there's gonna be cold days, but I've banked a fire in my heart. I know who Jesus Christ is. I know that God loves me and God cares for me. And when I need a blessing, I just open the air vents to heaven. I just open up those little vents to the stove of my heart. And I take that old, I take that old, a, a, a damper and I open it up so some wind begin to go and the spirit of God begin to blow and next thing I know my life may be looking bad but something's warming up inside because I banked a fire that's what that woman she was banking a fire she'd go to the synagogue Sabbath after Sabbath and she'd bank the fire and when Jesus Christ did show up he began to show us that God had a plan for our life. Notice it says she had a spirit of infirmity. That means it was not just a physical ailment. It means that Satan was messing with her life. There's physical ailments, then there's spiritual problems. And I mean, oh, a lot of poverty in the land is due to a spiritual problem. A lot, of, a lot of things that's happening in the land today is due to a spiritual problem. The corruption of America is due to a spiritual problem. It's not a money problem. It's not an education problem. It's not a medicine problem. It's not an ability problem. It is a spiritual problem. And this woman, she wasn't a bad person, but there was a spirit working against her. And I want you to know that there'll always be a spirit working against you. Not a Holy Spirit, an unholy spirit will always try to work against you. And that's why you need to make a fire in your heart. That's why you need to look to God and understand that God has a plan. You may have to walk through some narrow hallways in your life. You may have to face some dark moments in your life. You may have some disappointment in your life, but God has a purpose for you. And God has a purpose in his life. And God's eternal, everlasting purpose of God is to get you from here up there to be with him in heaven. That's God's eternal purpose. Amen. Not only of that, she could not lift up herself, meaning that no one could even help her. And I may know that when you're in such a mess that you can't even help yourself. The Bible says that she could not so much as in no wise, the scripture says, lift up herself. And I don't think anybody else could either. So you know what that made? That woman that was bent over that couldn't walk and stand up straight. She could walk, but she couldn't stand up straight. That made her a Jesus project. What? And I want to say to everybody in this room, you are a God project. Amen? God has made you a project. Think about it. Air, land, and sea was a project of God. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Think about it. The mountains with all the silver and gold and lead and all the, all the minerals in those mountains was a project of God. Think about the rivers and the lakes and the prairie fields and the valleys and the, and the, and the uh, Grand Canyon and the uh, 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 amazing Niagara Falls and all those things was a project of God. 
the sun and the moon and the stars, all a project of God. The beauty all around us, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the blessings that we have, all a project of God. Hello, the solar system, the quasar, the universe, all a project of God. And as I think about all those things being a project of God, and my, what a majestic ability he has. And what an amazing power he has. When I stop and think, what is man that thou art mindful of him? That the son of man, Jesus Christ, would come and visit us. We now are projects of God. Wow. And that woman was a project of God. Now what you know, the human race is a project of God. And it's God's purpose to take us to heaven. It's God's promise to bring us through and to get us there. Jesus sees her in verse 12 of Luke 13. And when Jesus saw her, he called her, her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmities. Let me tell you a little story. And I may have shared this story once before, but it's so important. A five-year-old boy, true story, five-year-old boy, had some serious stomach issues. It was several years ago, back when the medicine field wasn't as developed as it is. And uh, the parents loved this little boy so much. And because they loved this little boy, he was going to face a horrendous surgery at the hospital. They were, it was barbaric because it was years ago. And they knew the little fellow was gonna suffer a great deal when they cut him open. And the anesthesia wasn't as well equipped as it is today and they knew that the little fellow was gonna suffer greatly. But because they loved him, they let their love blind them and they didn't tell him. When it came time for him to go to the hospital, they said, do you wanna go get some ice cream? Do you wanna take a little trip? And the little boy was so excited to take a trip, go get a goodie. But instead of going to get a goodie, they took him straight to the hospital. Took him in without telling him what to expect. Took him in without telling him what he was going to face. Took him in without telling him the pain he was going to endure. They did the surgery. He did make it, thank God. He did survive the surgery, not without great intense pain. And because that it injured that little fella for life, he feared, he didn't trust, he hated, he was bitter, he was very broken in his spirit. He grew up a bitter, angry old man because that he had been deceived as a child. Why? Because his parents did it out of blind love. But let me tell you, friends, God's love is not blind. And though those parents didn't want to offend that little boy or hurt, hurt that little boy, but yet they realized that in the end they hurt him more than they could ever imagine. I want you to know that God's love, God is not blinded by his love for you. And God will tell you the truth. And the love of God is extremely honest. That's why the gospel is extremely honest. Yes, we'll have bad days. Yes, we're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Yes, we've, we've missed the mark with God. Yes, we live in a fallen world. Yes, it's going to be a time. It's going to be a time we're going to suffer and, and it's appointed unto men once to die. After that, the judgment. Yes, God is not withholding any information from us. God is telling us the truth. He's telling us the soul that sinners shall die. God tells us the wages of sin is death. God tells us the truth. He does not flinch his love is honest he tells us the way it is if you don't come the way of the blood of Jesus Christ you're going to lose your soul and die and go to the judgment of the fires of hell God is honest with us he's straightforward to us his love is honest as it can be but God says I'm going to find a way to get you from here to there I'm going to find a way to get you from earth to heaven I'm going to find a way to get you through the valley and through the despair and through the heartbreaks, I'm going to get you home. 
That's God. And God doesn't lie to us. This woman was bent. God's given us a picture. Jesus sees her and knows that she'd been that way for 18 years. And the Bible says in verse 13, and Jesus laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. That's the way it is today. God had to come and literally lay hands on us through the person of Jesus Christ. God came to give us a picture of God's love. Jesus is the picture of God's love. Jesus is the manifestation of God Almighty. Jesus is a picture greater than a thousand words. Jesus is the eternal, everlasting Son of God. Jesus came to show us who Jesus, uh, show us who God is. And Jesus cares for you. And Jesus loves you. Yes, you're going to have hard time. And yes, you're going to pass through the valley of the shadow of death, but not alone. I said, not alone. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Jesus Christ is there for us in this miserable world. We've got a big, big Savior, Jesus Christ, and he loves you. And so, Jesus lays hands on her, and she comes straight. She gets, she, her body straightens up. And she glorifies God. Amen. And that's what Jesus did with me. He got his hands on me and straightened me out. How many in this room would say Jesus got his hands on you and straightened you out too? Amen. I know some folks that are so crooked so dishonest, so crooked when they die you'll have to screw them into the ground to bury them. I mean, know, know someone like that, amen? But I, I just want to say that God had a plan for us. And God's not going to hide from us the misery that's around us. God's not hiding anything from us. God's very honest. His, his love is honest. God's love is extremely honest. And he's not going to hide you. And anyone that would try to hide you from the truth don't love you. Anyone that would try to keep you like those parents, they thought they loved their child, but they were not acting in love. I think they did love their child, but they, they didn't have the knowledge that they should have, should have been upright and for, uh, forward with him. And God is upright and forward with everyone in this room. Amen. Amen. Now, I said all this tonight to get to this last good part of the message. As far as I'm concerned, the best part is yet to come. And I'm not talking about the final amen either. But notice in Isaiah 14, verse 27. Now God has a plan for us. God wants to, God wants to take us to heaven. God wants to redeem us by his blood, by his power. And just as that woman was healed and she glorified God. Notice in verse 27, Isaiah 14. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed. Don't miss that. The Lord of hosts has, he has purpose. Isn't that good? God has purpose. And who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out. And let me say who that hand is. That's Jesus. His hand is stretched out. And who shall turn it back? Jesus Christ is the purpose of God. And Jesus Christ is taking us to heaven through his work, through his blood, through his power, and that is the purpose of God. The purpose of God is to get you out of yourself into the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his son. 
The purpose of God is to get you off of this planet through his son into the presence of God. God has chosen you. You are elected in the, in the beloved of God. God has chosen you in Christ to take you home. His purpose is to get you with him in heaven through that which you can't do. You cannot straighten up yourself. You cannot save yourself. You cannot help yourself. But God says, I can straighten them and I can help them and I can get them to glory. And God says, I'll send my son, Jesus Christ. And my son, Jesus Christ, will be the stretched hand of God. My son, Jesus Christ, will be the hand stretched out. And who shall turn it back? Nobody. I've made my purpose. I have a purpose for the world. And who shall disannul it? Nobody. Nobody can stop God. God is forever on your side. Amen. Let me show you some more good stuff. Jeremiah 15, verse 16 and 17. Jeremiah 15, verse 16 and 17. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Some of you in this room, you've been eating God's word. By the way, it's making you sweeter and smarter and more bearable to be around. You, did, you ain't listened to me or you would not have liked that last statement. Well, I know, brother. Thy words were found, Jeremiah says, and I did eat them. And thy word was, was unto me the joy and rejoicing of thine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. God is the provider, God is the host, God is the blesser, God is the merciful giver, God is the grace giver, God is the savior of the world, he's the host. Verse 17, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Verse 17 is an easy verse to grasp. Says I sat not in the assembly of the mockers. You give your heart to Jesus Christ, you live for God, and somebody is going to mock you. You say you trust Jesus, you say you believe in the blood of the lamb that washes your sins away, someone is going to mock you. You say you believe the word of God, and it might even be friends mock you. But the Bible says, I'm not going to sit in the congregation or sit in the crowd, the assembly of the mockers, nor am I going to rejoice with them. He said, I will sit alone because of thy hand. What is he saying? If I have to sit alone, my testimony is true. Jesus is Lord. If I have to sit alone, because of thy hand I sit alone, meaning I'm not going to get on board with the disbelief and the hate and the mockers and the, uh, uh, those that do not trust the Lord. I'm not going to get on that because I have a testimony. I have a testimony. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. You say, what are you talking about? Jeremiah says, God has filled me with indignation. You'd think the devil fills people with indignation. But Jeremiah says, no, God has filled me with indignation. What I'm indignant about is the mockers. What I'm indignant about is the haters. What I'm indignant about is the, is the sinful, wicked lifestyle of humanity. What I have indignation about, indigestion spiritually, indignation in your heart, I'm mad, I'm furious, I have no part of this bunch that hates God, have no part in this bunch that lives in sin. I sit alone. I sit there, if I have to sit alone, I'll sit there alone with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I will not sit among the mockers and I will be filled. I will hate those things that, obey, that oppose the things of God. You know what someone will tell you? Oh, you went over to that church and you got brainwashed. Well, what's wrong with getting your brain cleaned up? Hello? 
Somebody told me one time, I went to a Baptist church after I got saved, and, and, and someone in my family said, you're brainwashed. I said, well, what's wrong with that? My mind was pretty dirty. I appreciate it being washed. They said, no, no, you don't want to mean. I said, I know what you mean, and I don't believe what you're saying. I said, alone in the presence of God, Jesus Christ is my Lord, amen. Hello. Amen. Come on now. Praise God. Praise God. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers. I sat alone because of God's hand. What hand? That hand of the Lord stretched out that no one can turn back. That hand of Jesus Christ. Let me show you something else. Ephesians 3.11. You're not only a project of God, you're a promise that God has made to you. God has given us a promise and you are a project. Philippians 1, 6 says, I'm confident of this very thing. He which has begun a good work in me will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. God's working on me. Sometimes God gets out the loud jackhammer and he lets me have it. Other times God slices me silently, quickly cuts me in two with his word. But God's working on me. Amen? And it's not a bad work, it's a good work. Amen? Amen? In fact, it's not a loud work. It is a majestic work. Did you know that when they built Solomon's temple, they were not allowed to cut the rock on the site of the temple? They were not allowed to make noise. The, none of those things was allowed to be made on the site of the temple. It had to be done afar off on the hillsides, many times in Lebanon, other places close by, but they would cut them rocks and big stones, some of them 200, 300 feet, uh, pounds a piece, huge, six feet high and, and, and five uh, feet wide, and they would bring them after they cut them and hewn them out, measured it, and had it perfect fit to put it in the temple. It had to be done in silence. Not everybody hears what God's doing in my heart, but God is working on me. Isn't that good? Now notice verse 11 of Ephesians 3. It's talking about God's purpose. According to the eternal purpose which he has pur purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice it says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God chose us in Christ and purposed with his purpose to bring us to Christ and to give us eternal life as we come to Jesus. Look at 1 John 3, 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose. What purpose? Because the devil sins and the devil causes people to commit sin and people follow the devil and they commit sin. And for this purpose, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now isn't that a great verse? The purpose of God was to send his Son to destroy the works of the devil. Come on. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Listen to me. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Wow! Woo! You mean before there was a blade of grass, God had a purpose to take me home to be in heaven? Yes! Verse 10. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and the immortality to light through the gospel. Wow. So God brings us a word picture 
A picture is, is, is more valuable, bigger than a thousand words. God brings us a picture of deliverance. And God says, I have chosen you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you would go and bring forth fruit. God says, I have chosen you. I have elected you to go to heaven, but you can't get there unless you step inside my son, Jesus Christ. And when you step inside my son, Jesus Christ, makes no difference whether you're black or white, red or yellow, makes no difference who you are, whether you're rich or poor, makes no difference whether you're educated or unlearned, makes no difference who you are, makes no difference what depth of sin you've been in, just step inside, repent your sin. Just step inside Jesus Christ because God has purpose to take everyone to heaven through his son Jesus Christ. Wow. Isn't that good? Last verse. Romans 8 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. How many would agree that the woman that was bent over at the synagogue loved God? And the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his, there it is, purpose. You say, God must have a purpose for me being here. He does. He wants you to go to heaven. He has purposed in his heart that he gave his son Jesus so that everybody could go to heaven. I don't believe in this business, some can go and some can't. I don't believe in this predestination. So predestined for the Christian, not for a lost person anyway. But I don't believe in this stuff that God chose some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. No, God chooses anybody that gets in his son. Amen. Amen. Hello? Look up here. Look up here. Do you see any angel wings? How many would agree that I couldn't fly to Ozark, let alone across the United States? How many would agree I couldn't fly? I couldn't fly. In fact, I couldn't fly out here to the street, Selmore Road. In fact, I couldn't fly to the first row in this auditorium. I could fall into it, but I couldn't fly into it. Hello? And there's a lot of people that are trying to get to heaven doing this. And they're just beating the air. They're not going to get there. I can't fly to Washington, D.C. with this. But I can get in a jet airliner and I can step into that jet and whoosh, and I can go to LA, I can go to New York, I can go wherever, I can go to Russia, I can go to uh, China, I can go down there to where that little fat boy is there in North Korea, I can go wherever. But I ain't gonna get there doing this. I'm gonna get there by getting in a jet airliner, going that direction. And Jesus Christ is my jet airliner. Jesus Christ is my wings. Jesus Christ is my fuel. Jesus Christ is my goal. Jesus Christ is my stay. Jesus Christ is my ticket over in the glory land. Jesus Christ is my way to heaven. Jesus Christ is my jet airliner. Jesus Christ is my guide, my director, my, my taker. Jesus Christ is my pilot. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my savior. And I just get in him and say, I want to go where you're going. Amen. 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 I'll be honest with you, if I was walking and some people pulled over to give me a ride, I wouldn't take it because I don't want to go where they're going. Hello? But I'm glad I'm going to heaven. I'm in this room glad you're going to heaven because I got in Jesus. But I'm not going to sit with a bunch of mockers assembly of mockers that make fun. I've just about had enough of the critics. 
I'm filled with the indignation. I just about had enough of the gainsayers and the one that want to criticize church going people. I've, I've had enough of people that mock baptism, mock the baptism of the Spirit of God, mock the Lord Jesus Christ, mock the blood redeemed, the, the blood of the Lamb being washed by the blood. I've had enough of that. I'm not going to sit with the, the, the seat of the scornful. I'm not going to sit with the, in the congregation of the mockers. I'm just, if I have to sit alone, I've got a testimony. I'll sit alone with the hand of Almighty God and I'll trust Him. I'll love Him. I'll I'll, I'll give him praise because God has purpose in his heart to take me to heaven. God has a purpose. And his purpose is to get you from here with him. That's his purpose. You're his project. I said, you're his project. You're his piece of work. And boy, some of you are really a piece of work. But you're, you're his piece of work. You're his project. Why? Because you believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because you put your trust in the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because you've came the way that God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus for your sin. You've come, you believe Jesus, you believe God, you believe what God cares, you believe that God loves you, and God was loving enough, kind enough, and wise enough, and his love was extremely honest with us. You can't make it without my son. And so I put my trust in Jesus. Stand with me. Wow. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed I've I've enjoyed these scriptures. Man, I I love those scriptures. I love I love it that I have a purpose, but I love it more that He has a purpose. And His purpose is to take us home. I mean, when God has a purpose, hello. Let, let, me, let me put it real quick as Josh brings this. I got to read you the definition of purpose. God has a purpose. Let me give you the definition of purpose. Determination. One's resolve. A goal. Striving for favorable results. Working toward a job well done. That's God's purpose. And we're his purpose. Everlasting purpose of God. God's going to play and sing. We're going to give you an invitation. Maybe you'd like to just come down here to an altar and say, you know what? I want to make sure I'm in Jesus. I want to make sure I'm on board that Jesus airline. I'm going to make sure that I'm ready. Maybe there's someone in this room, you say, Preacher, I've been through a lot. I'm like the woman bent over. I've been coming and coming and coming and coming. And, and I just want to be mindful of the fact that I can bank, I can deposit things in my life. I can bank a fire. And on those cold days, I can say, I trust him. I trust him anyway. I look to my Savior, Jesus, anyway. That's important important that you never, ever, never, ever, never, ever give up. It's important that you focus on Jesus. Altars open.